Hymn number four, How Great Thou Art. This will be our offering hymn. a good song. It's been good day thus far. Appreciate you coming out for our mission conference. Don't forget, and uh, when you walked in, you received, a, if you're a member of the church, you received a yellow piece of paper, and that's our faith promise commitment card at the very end of the service. At the Not now, but at the very end, we'll be gathering those up, and we trust that uh, God has laid a mount on your heart that you can give for faith promise for uh, this new year, this missions year.
what a conference it's been. If you've been here since Friday night, you would acknowledge that God has done a wonderful job here at our church. I want to thank Brother Hastings for coming and being a part of our conference. And certainly our missionary, Brother Joe, thank you so much. Brother Miles, thank you for being a part of our uh, 2022 conference. And then my pastor, Brother Cotton, thank you so much, Brother Cotton, for coming and being a part of this. Um, kind of selfish this morning. I asked Judy to sing this next song that she's going to sing, and it's something that uh, our church thoroughly enjoys, and I can't think of a more fitting way uh, that we could uh, end this conference on this particular song, and uh, I think you'll know it, one of our favorites, and after Miss Judy sings, Brother Cotton, if you'll come and uh, share what God's laid upon your heart.
Well, nice try, Miss Judy. <laughs> A beautiful thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's just been a good time for me. I know why I'm here. I'm not, I'm not a conference speaker. I know that. Um, in fact, I'm a, an introvert. I dropped out of junior college because I was in speech and they were going to have me give an oral speech, so I quit. I uh, thought of getting up before a congregation scared me to death. I'd go to city council meetings and hear the ladies talk to the councilman and I would think, I wish I could do that like she does. I wish I could be eloquent like she is. And then here a little while back, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but here a while back, uh, we had a kind of an unfortunate accident and was in the hospital for I don't know how long. And I know why I'm here today is because your pastor uh, wanted to give me an opportunity to get back into the swing of things. He didn't say that, but I know him. And I know that he uh, is letting me have this opportunity to get my feet wet again. And and I sure do thank you, Brother Jeff. I appreciate it more than I can tell you. Beginning to get a few uh, invitations again. And I thank the Lord for that. I uh, don't want to ever be laid up because of the reason that I was. I, I just as soon keep preaching till the Lord's ready for me to go to heaven. And But thank you, Brother Jeff. You're a good man. I love you and I appreciate you. I didn't know you had a sister here. Uh, and kind of surprised me. She seemed like a nice lady. <laughs> I am so glad I got to meet all of you folks. So glad. And uh, I was talking to my wife last night after church, and she wants to know if we could come up here some weekend not tell y'all we're coming because she doesn't want to hear me. Uh, she, she told me she's heard everything I've got to say already. and But she wants to come up and meet you and wants me to take her antique shopping. and So we're going to we're going to come in one of these Sundays and hear what Mr. Kaufman has to say. Well, I don't like the last service. That's why I'm just piddling around. I, I, I don't like the last service. But we got to get started. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We, uh, uh, after one of our services one day, I had made the uh, comment during the message that as far as we know, there's not another cotton preacher. No other cottons in the family who preach as far as we know. And uh, I was reminded of this lady asked me about uh, cotton before the church service today. And as far as I know, uh, unless he's got money. Now, if he's got money, but uh, 
I told the people that as far as we know, there's not another cotton in the ministry. And one of our deacons, bless the Lord, uh, thank you for good deacon. I wish I'd have had some. Uh, <laughs> One of our deacons came out and he said, Brother Cotton, I hate to tell you this, but there's still not a preacher in the Cotton family. <laughs> so see why I enjoy being around people that seem to like me. Uh, uh, but you have been a real, real blessing. You missionaries, God bless you. I've got so much respect for the missionaries. And I thank the Lord for these men. You had three good ones this week. And I thank the Lord for them. Luke chapter 12. Let's begin reading verse number 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, And be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So it is, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father, I pray that you'll help me today, please. I I don't ask to preach a good message. I ask that you will use this message to help the people. Please, Father, speak to our hearts. Speak to my heart especially, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And... 1982, a new board game hit the market. I imagine some of you've played it. It's called Trivial Pursuit. I've not played it, but I know a little bit about it. Uh, two years later, in 1984, over 20 million games had been sold here in the United States. 20 million games. Can you imagine that? Now the word and and the object of the game as I understand it is you move around the board by answering questions. And the word trivia means of little significance. Of very little value. And the reason why the game is called Trivial Pursuit is because the questions that you have to answer doesn't matter if you know them or not. They don't. They're, they're trivial. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm taking these from one of the games. What animals did the Ricardos and Murches raise whenever they uh, moved back to Connecticut? By the way, there's Cash awards if you get these. <laughs> Chickens. I figured everybody would know that one. Chickens. This one I don't know that you will know. What are the names of Donald Duck's parents? Hortense and Quackmore. Did you know that? (laughs) See, I I like for church to also be an educational experience. (laughs) Hortense and Quackmore. 
Approximately how many peanuts are in a 28-ounce jar of peanut butter? <laughs> Approximately 1,200. Someone may want to know that at work tomorrow. and you, you got it right there. Uh, what's the top selling campus snack? According to the American Association of College Stores, the leading campus snack, Oreo cookies. That's the leading snack. What did cleaning crews remove 600 pounds of from the Statue of Liberty? Chewing gum. Uh, I wish I had some more of these because I think you like them better than you will the sermon. But, but that's all I got. But it's called Trivial Pursuit because those questions, if you know them, it's not going to better you in life. And if you don't know them, it's not going to make life harder for you. It's Trivial Pursuit. Now the reason why I'm talking about this is because a good many people, unfortunately, are playing trivial pursuit with their life. I don't know whether we got anyone like that here or, or, or not, but I know that the Lord laid this on my heart. And so I want to talk to you about it. What I mean when I say that people are spending their life on trivial things, I'm talking about things that have very little value. Things that don't have much worth at all. Please hear what I'm about to say. If the focus of your life is to have a good time, that's a very trivial purpose. That's a very trivial way to spend your life. If you live to see how much money you can accumulate or how many possessions you can accumulate, that's a trivial pursuit. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because these are the things that so many of us have taken our eyes off of missions for and we've gone into this trivial pursuit where we're trying to get things that appeal to our flesh and we're trying to have a good time and this and that. And uh, uh, according to the text that we read here, that is a serious, serious thing to do. Now, there are many trivial things that aren't a sin in and of themselves. Becoming rich is not a sin. I know sometimes we, we preachers make it sound like if you've got something, then you must have sinned to have gotten it. Uh, I like to see my church members get rich because that might be a raise in salary. So, so there's not, not anything wrong with having finances. In fact, I've known some Christians who were very, very, uh, good at supporting the Lord's work with what God had given them. And by the way, that's what we want you to do when it comes to missions. If that hasn't been a part of your life, we want it to be. And in supporting missions, you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And you'll be able to have those uh, treasures to enjoy for the rest of eternity. But being rich is not a sin. Having a good time is not a sin. Having a good-sized bank account and a new car and a nice home, that's not a sin. The sin comes when a person takes the valuable gift of life that God has given them and they use it on trivial things, on trinkets, on things that are not going to last. That's where the sin comes in. This morning I want to show you quickly what some of the trivial things are that people are giving their lives to. And uh, please listen not to the 
feeble way the message is presented, but listen to what the Bible tells us about this. Anything, number one, that gives earthly benefits but not eternal benefits is trivial. Anything, whatever it might be, it may not be a sin in and of itself, but anything that gives uh, earthly benefits but not eternal benefits is trivial. Now, I didn't say that anything that gives earthly benefits is wrong. I don't want you to get that idea from the message. But I am saying that such a thing is trivial and needs to be treated as much and we need to give it its proper place in our life rather than exalting it to the main place in our life. I'm going to pass away someday. In fact, I've reached the place in life where I can stand on my tiptoes and almost see into heaven. I know you won't believe this, but I had my 78th birthday. And I know you're not going to believe that. You know, yes. But I'm, I'm getting close to heaven. And when that time comes, then to look back on my life, the things that I did here in this life with my flesh and the things that I did that did not have any spiritual benefit or value to them is simply going to be burned up. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, you and I need to live with the understanding. A lot of folks don't, but we need to live with the understanding that this earth and everything that is in it is going to be burned up someday. Uh, that's what the Bible says, and uh, we believe what the Bible says. Second Peter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great uh, noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. That's not figuratively speaking. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, one of the days, the phys- well, these days soon, the physical earth, the physical universe is going to be burned up. Now what that means is the bank's going to be burned up. The money in the bank's going to be burned up. The IRAs and uh, the CDs and so on. The ball fields that Christians are so often tempted to go to on Sunday instead of go to church. The golf courses that folks spend time on when they should be in church. Those things are all going to be burned up. The Lord told us that. I'm not telling you that to make you sad. It's not a reason to be sad. I can, I'm looking kind of forward to us getting to that point. Because then we can go to heaven and uh, I'd like to do that. It would be a good thing for us to remind ourselves, why are we here? And that's why I wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, I, I'm afraid there might be folks that get caught up in, in the trivial, and I don't want you doing that. We are here to point people to Christ. That's it. He would rather have us in heaven, don't you imagine? He would like to have the physical uh, fellowship with you and me. But He doesn't have us there yet because He's got a work down here that He wants us to do. We're here to be the tool that God uses to build up His church. Uh, This is the only organization that God has on earth for doing His work. This is it. Not another one. This is it. We're here to be living Bibles for the world to read. And these works are all eternal in, the, in, in nature. And after every earthly thing has been burned up in the fires of God's judgment, the only things that are done for Christ or the, or, or the only things that are going to last are the things done for Christ. You've heard that 
a little saying, only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now here's the heartbreaking thing that so many Christians are doing. They're neglecting those things that have eternal consequences. They're neglecting missions and other things that have eternal consequences. And as a result, they're wasting their life on trivial things. And the sad thing is there's not going to be any way for us to go back and do that. Right now is the time we have for doing something for Christ. What about that Christian who won't be faithful to church? He'll wish someday he was faithful, but can't do anything about it then. What about that Christian that would rather spend his money on himself than invest in missions? There will come a day when he will wish that he could have given to the Lord's work. Uh, so what we need to do is fix in our mind what is the important thing for me to do with my life. I think about the story of one of the members, a Dallas millionaire. He's a member of the First Baptist Church there in Dallas. This was back in the 30s when the financial market crashed and when the Depression began. And this gentleman was one of the largest givers to the First Baptist Church in Dallas. But when the crash came, he lost it all. Everything was taken. One day someone came up to him and said, I bet you would like to have all that money back that you gave to the church, wouldn't you? And he said, no, sir. I wouldn't like to have that money back. The money I gave to the Lord's work is the only thing I have left. All the rest of it is gone. That's how we ought to look at this. All the money he said I've invested, I've got. The rest is gone. So what I'm telling you this morning is that is uh, only if, if it just benefits the flesh, that's trivial, and we ought to give it the proper place in our life. Number two, anything that brings us counterfeit riches instead of true riches is trivial. Let me say it again. I'm not saying that having artificial riches are sinful. They're not. They're just trivial. Just a piece of green paper. That's really all it is. And I'm not saying that uh, they're sinful, I'm saying it's trivial. In fact, I don't think that the desire to be rich is necessarily a bad desire to have. I think God gave us that desire. The only thing is, He wants us to have the true riches, not false riches. He uh, uh, mentioned that in the uh, in the Scripture. So he's not against us having riches. True riches aren't measured, however, in dollars and cents. True riches are measured in souls. True riches are measured in uh, mission works that you participated in helping support. Uh, True riches are a contented spirit and a joyful heart and a forgiving spirit and a serving spirit, a strong faith. Those are the true riches. And those are the things that should get our attention. I saw a bumper sticker uh, some time ago. I had to think a minute to figure out what it was saying. The bumper sticker said, He who dies with the most toys wins. And there has never been a bigger untruth told to mankind than that. Uh, If all you have when you die is toys, you've lost. There's so much you could have had that you're missing out on. Truth is that when you die, if all you have to show for your life 
to some carnal earthly thing, then you are a loser, according to the Scripture. It's so heartbreaking to see how many so-called Christians there are who have sacrificed having any kind of a relationship with the Lord, and they've sacrificed any kind of involvement in the Lord's work, such as missions, and someday they're going to wake up and realize that they played trivial pursuit with their life, and they won't have one thing to show for it. A rich fellow over in England died. And of course, he left every penny of his artificial riches behind. And someone had a tombstone put on his grave. And on that tombstone, they had these words engraved. Here lies a miser who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering wealth. Now where he is, or how he fares, nobody knows, and nobody cares. It'd be a sad way to leave this world, wouldn't it? But that is your epitaph. Number three. Talk to you about what the trivial things are. Number three, anything that simply entertains us but does not satisfy us is trivial. Anything that entertains us but doesn't satisfy us is trivial. Entertainment is a pleasurable thing as long as it's enjoyed in moderation. There's evidence to show that Paul was somewhat interested in boxing and some of the Olympic games and and training, he was uh, interested in some of those. Just uh, this past week, I got back from uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. I go up there every year to see the National Junior College Tournament. And uh, you get to see basketball all day, every day for a week. When I got out of there, my eyeballs were dribbling. But, and I'm not trying to sound overly spiritual, I was walking out to my car the last night of the tournament, and I thought to myself, is that it? Is that, is that all this is going to do? The team that won enjoyed it for a few moments, but then those moments are quickly gone, and there's no satisfaction left. The biggest blessings that you can have are the ones that God gives and the pleasure that He brings to the human soul. When I was pastoring and and making a good salary, by the way, why didn't y'all tell me about retirement? I didn't know it was going to be like that. But anyway, uh, Joanne and I love giving to missions. And we regularly tried to increase our giving to missions. I had as my goal, I think we reached it the last year I was there, but I had as my goal to give more to foreign missions than anybody else in Trinity Baptist. And God blessed us. It's not that we did anything. God blessed us. And there were times that God uh, put money in our hands because He knew that we were going to see that He gets a good portion of it. And that's what I want you to understand this morning. Uh, The trivial things, they're okay, but they just last for a moment and they're gone. The things that are, that are going to last for eternity are the things we've been talking about this week. Missions. I hope this church will just bust at the seams.
taking care of missions. I think I told you the other night, if, if I didn't, I probably should have, and I just forgot it. But I think I told you about how God blessed Trinity Baptist, and I could bore you to tears telling you stories of what God did for our church. And there was nothing in my mind and in the minds of our people to account for it except for God blessing a giving people. It got so, and I'm serious about this, Brother Kaufman, it got so that we would take on some big mission project and then the people would say, now how's God going to fund this? How's God going to take care of it? Because they just expected it to happen. And you know what? He did. Uh, I could tell you about the mission program at Trinity, but our time's up. And that lady told me last night, wait till tomorrow. And so I want to see what's there. I challenge you. I challenge you as someone who has seen it work. I know it works. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. These guys are worth it. They're worth it. Brother Kaufman, you come ahead and thank you again, brother. Thank you. Here in just a few moments, you that are members of Calvary Baptist Church, we have a decision to make. And that's what we're going to do for worldwide missions. I've never seen one Christian that got involved in worldwide missions could ever say, God wasn't good to me. These men that we've had in our room and that have come this week, they're dependent on churches just like this. There's no other program that's going to help them like the local church. This is our responsibility. Now what we've got to decide is how are you going to play a part in this? Preacher will do his part. Miss Judy will do her part. What about you? Father, I just ask for the next few moments as Brother Randy, Miss Janice will sing our invitation hymn <clears throat> that if we just need to come and ask the Lord what he would have us to do this would be a great time to do so before we do our faith promise pledge. Father, I don't know anyone else's heart. I don't know anyone else's attitude. But Father, I do know missions is a heartbeat of yours. Matter of fact, it's something you told us to do. Now, what will we do? Would you stand all over the building? If you just need to come and say, God, here am I. I'll do what you asked me to do.